thank you, Lord. Oh, it's good to know you. It's so good to know the truth, Lord. How you've blessed us, how you've loved us. You've placed our feet on solid ground. We will not be shaken. God, I just proclaim greater faith today than we've ever had before. Greater faith in this community, in this congregation. Our feet are planted on solid ground. We will not be shaken. The storms of life may come and beat against the walls, but we are planted on the rock. We are planted in you. Thank you, Lord, for the security, the safety that we have in you today. Thank you for the hope that we have in you, Jesus. We're so grateful in every season. It's so good to know you and to worship you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Isn't it good to worship together and to serve the Lord together? God is good. Before you're seated, would you turn to a few people and just welcome them here and tell them you're glad that they're here with you, worshiping with you. And then you can be seated. Well, as you're saying hello here on campus, thank you so much. Whether you're online or here, thank you for celebrating with us life change. Can you one more time give it up for those today that, that got baptized? We're so thankful for them and what God's doing in their life and just to be part of their journey. And, and listen, one of the reasons um, why, why uh, we, every single week, another aspect of our service, uh, another aspect of our worship is in the area of, of giving. And, and as we get ready to, um, to do that, we want you to know like this is the reason why we give. That we don't, we, we don't give for maybe the things that we, you, you think maybe you give, keep the lights on or, or pay salaries or anything like that. And that, that's a small part of it. But the reason that we, that we give and, and God asks us for our hearts, not our wallets, is for the purpose of life change here in the triad. Amen. And, and uh, we just get to be a part of, of that, a small part of that. So we're just so thankful for your generosity. And, uh, and so if you would like to partner with what uh, Calvary is doing here in the triad all over the world as we you know, try to listen to the heart of God and to impact this world. There's a few ways you can do so this morning. You can always give at calvarytriad.church, uh, and there's several options there for you to give. Give to Kingdom Builders um, or other options. You can also text to give this morning. Um, one of the most convenient ways is text to give. You can text uh, your amount to 84321, um, and you can give that way um, as well. But also, there in front of you, there's some envelopes, and before you, leave today you can drop that off that gift in any of the doors thank you so much for your generosity thank you for partnering with us as we just try to listen to the lord and make an impact and difference in this world for for life change well for everything else going on here at calvary this week please check out the screens hey everybody i'm nicole and welcome to calvary thanks for worshiping with us today Great things are happening here at Calvary, so check this out. Our Senior Adult Ministries invites you to celebrate Christmas with them on Sunday, December 18th at 5.30 p.m. in the East Auditorium. Join Sam's for a night of fun and a catered dinner. Seating is limited, so register as soon as possible. We love serving our community, and a few ways that we do that here at Calvary are through the Giving Tree and our Blanket Drive. The Giving Tree is an opportunity to provide Christmas gifts for children in our community and our Blanket Drive provides blankets for those in need. We will be accepting donations through December 18th. For more information and to get involved, please visit the Kingdom Builders lobby. The holiday season is here. Make sure you mark your calendars for our Christmas service on Friday, December 23rd. Also, please note that Sunday, December 25th and Sunday, January 1st will be online only. No in-person services will be held on Christmas or New Year's Day. For more information on all of these events or to register, visit calvarytriad.church info. We're so glad you could join us today and make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at calvarytriad.church and on Facebook and Instagram at calvarytriad. Now, 
Let's prepare our hearts for God's Word. Hope. We hear that word and we think of positivity or wishful thinking. But hope is something different. It's greater, it's better, and it's more. Hope is choosing to wait for God to bring His goodness into our lives. It's remembering His faithfulness in our past and trusting His plans for our future. Hope rises when we encounter the light that shatters the darkness and when the long-awaited Messiah makes His home with us. It's an invitation for every person, and it's here now because Jesus is here now. This is hope. Amen. Well, are you ready? Are you ready for Christmas? Is it, it feels like the season, right? Everybody's getting in the mood. How many of you have already changed the radio station in your car to the Christmas station, right? You did it before Thanksgiving too, didn't you? You cheated and got ahead of that. Well, today we start in a, kind of a, a little mini series for our Christmas and the Advent season. And we're starting with this message of hope. And we're going to be tackling some uh, incredible truths of this Christmas story. It's foundation of hope and love and joy and peace. And God just has an incredible story that we always focus on this time of year that's just, a, it's, it's fun. I, I love it. I just, uh, I'm a Christmas guy. I love it. I put the lights, put some more lights out at the house yesterday. The neighbors stopped by as they were walking and said, yeah, you're just going all out. And I just, you know, yeah, it's Christmas, you know, that kind of deal. And so it's just a fun, fun season. And then today, quite honestly, just the, the, the planning of things, we talked about even having baptism today and, you know, just all the other stuff. I was like, no, we got to still have it because isn't this awesome to celebrate with so many lives of making a fresh start? Talk about hope, right? That's an incredible thing. That was fun. I love it. I, I love it. I love it. I love it. I think God is up to something. I think he's got some uh, plans for, I know he has plans for us during this season, not just to sit back and say, okay, let's just, uh, you know, I, I know there's an opportunity of rest and reflection and that's good and right. And there's those elements. But the truth of it is, is that this world needs hope and we have it. And that's an incredible opportunity and responsibility for us. And so, boy, I'm just excited about what God's going to do these next few weeks. Today's the beginning of this Advent type series. And some of you have, have been familiar with that word Advent. You had Advent calendars on your, your wall, maybe growing up. Well, he had it too. We had the little felt thing. You had the Christmas tree and then one through 25, right? And you pulled out an ornament and put it on. And my, my sister and I, when growing up, I remember the expectation of something magical happening whenever you pulled that number 25. 25 out, right? Because man, the big man was coming, right? It was Santa's day, you know, and then this expectation of just this incredible moment. Some of you um, have walked through those seasons and you guys have small kiddos at this, this time. I'm a little bit jealous of you. you haven't hit grand, grandparent stage yet, but um, it's one of those things that I just, the, this, this uh, awe and wonder and imagination of expectation is something that we would all do well to kind of lean into a little bit, not for Santa and all that stuff. I, I'm just, yeah, whatever, but just the, the reason for the season. And we should be a people of hope, right? It should be a season where we don't go, oh, I got to go to the mall again. Just stay away from the mall. I'll just tell you that right now. There's the wisdom for the day. But just having this idea of hope, the season of Advent, the, the word Advent really means the, the coming or the arrival of, of hope. And it is a, it's been a tradition all through the early church, and we kind of lean into it in this season too, that we would focus our attention on the coming and that Jesus came. He, he came and he was here and he, he is here. We'll talk about that more here. And he came, he's here and he's coming again. But this idea of coming and arrival is significant. We use it to celebrate the fact that he came to earth and to celebrate the fact that he is coming again. Can I hear an amen in the place? We have a hope of the resurrection here and, and it's just an incredible season. 
I love the way N.T. Wright, a great author, theologian, says this about the Advent. He says this, with that first Advent, it was clear that God's rescue operation for humans and the world had been decisively begun, but not yet completed. Jesus really did launch God's kingdom on earth as in heaven in his career, in his public career, in his death and resurrection. But it was very clear also that because of the sort of the thing this kingdom was, that it would then need to make its way through the humble, self-giving sacrifice of Jesus' followers until the time when Jesus would return to finish the work, to put all things right, to banish evil and death forever and bring heaven and earth completely together. This Advent series, it starts, the foundation is hope. And can I just encourage you to go on a little journey with me today and put yourself in the same frame of mind and perspective that possibly those shepherds and the wise men and all the stories and the characters that we know When there was word of this coming king, there was an expectation that was raised. There was a sense of, could it be in their lives? And I'm here to tell you today, church, that the season of hope in this Christmas season is not just about celebrating that he came, but it is about looking forward to the fact that he will come again. And so today, this idea of hope is not some historical perspective, but it is a a hope for the future. It is a hope for what God has in store for us now and in the future. That So many times, can I just be really transparent with you today and say that a lot of times we get into this season where we talk about future things, especially as it relates to spiritual, and it's really tough for have us to have hope. It's really tough for us to believe maybe the future looks better. Why? Because we bring into our present possibly some some missed or unfulfilled expectations that this world and, and our flesh and our family and our friends has, has given to us. And we have these unfulfilled expectations that we thought we should have hope in, and we bring that kind of frustration over here and say, well, if that's not, that expectation is not being met, then it's really tough for me to believe and have hope. We're going to see today how through God's word that it's because of that dynamic that even the writers of, of the, the gospel through, through different scriptures recognize that and said because of that, it becomes even more important for you to make sure that currently your hope is put on something that cannot, will not, has not, will never fail you in his word. That's where our hope is. These unmet expectations, they make a... They make us kind of ponder a little bit as to the reasons why we have that. How many of you have ever had a Christmas list item that you did not receive? Can you just go there with me? Yeah. How many of you have some things on your list or whatever this year that you're like, yeah, that'll never happen or whatever? My kids actually, in fact, Chloe actually asked me this year, she's just uh, such maturity. She said, dad, you need to do a Christmas list. I'm like, I don't need anything, you know, whatever. But my kids are all adult kids. And so they're, what do you get dad, right? Besides socks and chocolate covered peanuts. That's what we used to always get my grandpa, right? Um, but so they gave this list. Well, it was kind of, it was kind of intimidating to create a, a list. I don't need anything, right? But I, I also know that back in the day when I was a kiddo, oh my goodness, those lists, they were important, Right. And, and our traditions and how we do that, they're all different from different families. But I just remember two specific situations where I had expectations of receiving a particular gift that were pretty high. One was back in the day and when, when the styles were just kind of coming out and everybody's like, oh yeah, those are still cool today. Well, it's kind of cyclical, right? But back when the first Air Jordans came out, like it was like the, there was just like this, this buzz and you know, you got to have the Air Force ones. Oh man. And you know, they weren't just all the different styles now. It was the red and black and white, the, the, the originals, right? You got to have them. And I remember seeing a shoebox size gift under the tree after I had asked, asked for that gift. And I'm just like, dear Jesus, you can just come right now because those Jordans are under the tree. And I'm telling you, there was an expectation in my life. Oh, my, I walked through and my parents, we used to, they used, my mom used to wrap presents and put them on there and just to kind of mess with our heads. I don't know what you, whatever, but the expectation was high. 
And so Christmas morning, I get this box, and it's the shoebox size. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I have hope for this gift. And my, my, my grandma, who uh, is, she's with Jesus now, but my dad's mom, love her to death. She's an incredible woman of God, saw fit that this year she was going to bless me with a gift, and I didn't know it, but it was in that box. And I opened up the box that should have been my Air Jordans, right? It was going to be such expected whatever. And my grandma, I love her. I still don't, I don't know if I still have these, but they were pretty hideous. I'll just be honest with you. Crocheted slippers for her grandson. Yeah. Yeah. It was not, a, not, not my finest moment of grace, I'm sure. I don't remember exactly how I responded, but I remember the scar even to this day of that that hope and expectation. Fast forward a few years, and that was, that was me as a child. And there's still some opportunities, for example, as an adult, right? When I, uh, it was either right before we were married, um, we were getting ready to be married, uh, Kim and myself, and so all the preparation, all that stuff. And, um, and I needed, needed, right? Needed um, a, a new TV, right? And I wanted a new TV. I probably for, you know, a different room of the house, we're thinking about starting a home and all this stuff. And back in the day, TVs weren't like this thin. You understand? They actually, young people, they actually like had a box, right? This huge tube in the back it looked like a, a small sedan, right? But it was really just a 19 inch TV or whatever. And I remember I, I needed this, needed this TV, had this expectation. And sure enough, uh, beside the tree in my mom and dad's house, when we got there, or uh, when we were celebrating, whatever, there's this box. And I'm like, dear Jesus, yes, thank you. Thank you, mom, dad. You, you have hit the mark here, expectations. And I remember trying to be a little bit more graceful when my mom saw fit that uh, we needed to start a house uh, in the future, right? Open up that box expecting a TV, box of dishes, ladies and gentlemen, box of dishes, my mom said, you should be happy. There were false graphs. Some of you know those, you know, like real fancy, you know, ooh, dishes, like whatever. You know, where's my TV? This idea of expectations and hope can sometimes cloud the way we even view Scripture when we've had kind of funny, I get it, but the truth of it is, is there are probably some really serious missed expectation stories in this room that you bring that lens with you to see how you view this Christmas story. And if you're not careful, you allow those experiences to rob you of hope. And today, I wanna submit to you that there's a story in God's word that just confronts that and gives us a recalibration moment of setting this foundation for the entire Christmas story. So for the next few weeks, we're gonna be in Luke chapter one and two. Today, starting in the first chapter of the book of Luke. For many of you that may have been with us in the, the beginning of the series a few months ago about the story continues, the book of Acts. Luke, the author of his gospel, Luke, is also the author of the book of Acts. The reason I bring that up is because we covered then and I'll cover briefly now the importance that Luke, being a physician, he had this extreme significance in what he was portraying that he wanted and needed to convince his readers and us that what he was about to say was not just his opinion, but it was fact. It was based upon eyewitness accounts. It was, it was credible. It was a testimony of the events and report that could be believed and trusted. And Luke, in his gospel in chapter one, he starts it off the same way, which gives us the foundation for this idea of having hope. In the chapter one, he says this, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use the eyewitness reports. Remember, we talked about this in Acts. They use the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated from the very beginning, I, I, everything from the very beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you most honorable Theophilus. Many people say that that was a specific person. Others say it was just kind of a, a beloved brethren can be related to all of us. And then he said this, he said, so you, 
us, we can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. The reason why this is significant is that I want to stop today and just give this at the very outset of this idea of Advent, because if you don't believe that this, the, the sincerity and the accuracy of the report, then the enemy sneaks in and says, well, that idea of joy and peace, that's really on shaky ground too. You know, that idea of that, that expectation you had, well, this is the same way. You can't really trust it. This idea of hope, it's just kind of you having wishful thinking. There's no solid foundation for you to believe that on. I'm here to tell you that through centuries and centuries of history that we have a report that even from the very beginning was based upon eyewitness reports, accurate accounts of what had indeed happened. There's so many different ways that we could go into this this idea of the the validity of this hope, the the brief summary is this, that Luke is saying, hey, before we even get to baby in a manger, before we even get to prophecies of John the Baptist, we'll see here in a minute, or prophecies that, that Mary received or Joseph, before we even get there, you better make sure your hope is on solid ground. Do you understand how important that is? Because if not, we bring the lens of unmet expectation, the experience of that. We allow it to, to, to jade our expectation and experience of this message of this Christmas season. And before long, we water it down to a, a fat man in a Santa Claus suit at the mall that we put our kids on. We say, oh, okay, the reason for the season, right? You get it? And, and if not, if we're not careful, we miss... We miss hope that Jesus did come to this earth. He did live among us. He actually left so that he could send his spirit to continue to be with us and gave us a promise that he would come again. It's past hope, it's current hope, and it's future hope. Well, Luke sets us up at the very beginning like this. Then he goes on to tell a story of a husband and wife, Zachariah and Elizabeth, that found themselves in a very bleak situation. The Bible says in the, the, the recounting of the story after the portion we're going to read that they were older in age, they had not yet had children, and they were discouraged expectation did not meet up their reality. They were frustrated. And so Zechariah, he was a priest and he finds himself in this moment in chapter one, verse 11. It says, while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. Little rabbit trail right here. I want to remind you of something. Friday night, December 23rd, you are going to see not an angel or angels that terrify you, but some of the most adorable angels that this world has ever seen, right? So this past week, they had practice and rehearsal and stuff for, for getting ready for Friday, December 23rd. It's going to be awesome. And I was reading through and prep uh, for the message this morning in this passage of scripture and then comparing it to the experience of the angels that I saw this, this week preparing, nothing the same, right? Because I'm telling you, um, I see Pastor Jesus over here to my right and uh, was uh, he's just so proud. I know he's gonna be proud, but his, his oldest daughter, Journey, was one of the angels. Let me just tell you what, was not terrified one bit when I saw her. Right? I'm like, oh, dear Jesus, Pastor G, you've got three Lord bless you, <laughs> down the road, right? But the most adorable, one of the angels there, and I'm telling you, when you read this story, it was not that way. So you'll, you'll see some amazingly beautiful angels Friday night on the 23rd. Zachariah had a different experience. You ever put yourself, when you read through God's word sometimes, if you're not careful, you just read it and you say, oh yeah, I've read this story before, and, and you just kind of skim. Don't do that with this story. Here's Zechariah, he's a priest, he's a godly man, he's mature, he, he's, he's solid in his faith, right? He's seen God do things, great things, and yet he's at this discouraging moment and this angel interrupts his life, comes into the scene, and he is terrified. 
right? This is not a child that is scared of the boogeyman, right? This is a solid, mature man that's terrified by this. The reason why this is significant is because sometimes God has to kind of interrupt us and shake us a little bit and say, hey, I've got a word for you today. And he'll do that sometimes by even being in a church service like this and saying, and having some guy just talk to you about hope. Sometimes God needs to interrupt our lives. Zechariah had this experience. He was, he was terrified. He was overwhelmed with fear. But the angel says, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. We could stop right there and, and go eat lunch because that's an incredible message of hope right there that God, even to this day, is still saying to you in this room, God has heard your prayer. God still hears your prayer. Sometime during this season, when we have expectation and we start singing message songs and hope and joy, in the back of our mind, we say, yeah, but, yeah, but this situation, and I'm here to tell you today that even though the answer to your prayer may not have come yet the way you think it should, God hears your prayer. He hears, he's always heard. He may not act the way you want him to, but he's heard your prayer. He says to Zechariah, your wife, Elizabeth, again, older, hasn't born children yet. He says, your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son and you're to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord expectation and hope right there. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. And you'll see here in a minute how this task that the angel Gabriel put to John, it's still our task as well. That this hope that we have is there for a reason that God has for us. So as we look at these two situations, that this foundation is sure, that Luke sets it up, that you can believe this report, and then this, this example that he gives us of Zachariah and Elizabeth, a bleak situation, no kids, ah, just frustration, God breathes hope into that situation. I ask myself two questions as it relates to this story. Number one, what is our hope? We gotta define it. We gotta make sure that we understand what is this idea of hope. Again, it's not just a theme that we put on our house at Christmas, right? It's not just something that we say. What is our hope? So we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And then, and then second, what impact, what impact should hope have in our life? What is our hope? The definition of this word hope just simply says this, the anticip anticipation of good not yet here or as yet unseen. I love, like I said, I'm gonna say this probably so many times in the next few years, I love the Christmas season because it seems like there's just this anticipation, expectation on everything, right? Can't wait till the post-Christmas sales. I can't wait till the Christmas music goes off the radio. I can't wait till this. It seems like we're always in this expectation type mindset. I, right now, Kim and I and, and Chloe as well, I, I'm expectation of December 20th because that's when the rest of my kiddos are coming home. And everybody's asked, are you going back home, you know, to, to wherever, Texas or Missouri, wherever's home, right? For Christmas, like, no, they're coming home. Like, this is home, right? And so I have this expectation of the family being, you have the same things. And, and for different, you know, people in different seasons of life, that expectation of there is there. But this idea of hope, it's always about this anticipation of a good that's not yet here, but we have an understanding that it'll be there. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews chapter 11. He says that faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. 
Now, the difference between hope and wishful thinking is that there's evidence of the things we cannot see. How in the world do you have hope that Jesus will one day return? Well, because I have hope that the recounts, the accounts of the reports of the Lord are, are, are valid and have been verified. His past behavior and experience has proven it. I know and I have, 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 have proof that he is with me here. He hears and answers my prayer. And so my hope and my foundation believes for the things unseen. It's not merely wishful thinking or something that, you know, oh boy, I wish this would go our way or I'm, I'm, I'm betting on this, you know, I'm hoping for that or whatever. That's just a wish. Hope is founded upon something that has been proven faithful in the past. And God has been faithful in the past. And his word says he doesn't even change. He can't change. He remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when we come to this season of, 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 of hope and joy and peace, it's really important that we make sure what our foundation is on this. So in Luke's telling of this Christmas story in chapter one and chapter two, before we even get to the birth of Jesus, he makes sure that we have this foundation true and right. It was significant when he wrote this um, in the culture that he had, had written it to was in this, this Greco-Roman culture that, that hope and this idea of believing for something that was, that was unseen was really significantly um, unique and, and abnormal. It was not the norm. In fact, this idea of having hope would have been viewed as someone that, that was very desperate. That someone would, that would have portrayed idea, uh, an idea of hope in an unseen would have been viewed, wow, you are so immature and childish and unstable. How, this, you need the, you know, the, the very solid can be seen, no hope. Hope was looked at as a very desperate posture. The truth of it is, is that when Jesus came along and was the very embodiment of hope, there began to be a shift. And then as they, as the people in the culture saw that he wasn't just a lot of lip service, right? He wasn't just saying it. The, the things he said, they were actually being fulfilled. The stories that I heard as a child in prophecy in my, in my growing up of, of Moses and the father, they were actually being fulfilled. And this infusion of hope came into the society and it began to raise the value and the idea of this virtue of hope. And to this day, I'm telling you, church, do not lose your sense of wonder and hope for the things yet unseen. Because in this season, we are founded on, on firm foundation in the present because of the faithfulness of God in the past, the truth of his word here. And because of that, we can be hopeful and, and, and anticipatory of things unseen. This story could be trusted. It was a firm source of hope for the readers and for us. We come to this season too, and I'm firmly aware that many of us in this room possibly find ourselves in a situation that Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth found themselves in. There's some discouragement. There's, there's an awareness of current reality that feels really heavy. There's not joy. There's not peace. Many of you may be in the room and you say, you know what, Pastor John, I believe that's true, but my feelings are, are really having a tough time with this. My, my, my experience in my life is really not matching up with this. And can I just spend a few seconds here today to encourage you and say, you know what, Zachariah was there too, and the angel interrupted him, and so as bold as I can be, can I just interrupt your life for a minute and say to you that I know that sometimes that you have, have prayers and hope for children, possibly, or for family members that are living their lives differently than the way God wants them to and that you want for them to. Right now, I understand the tension. God provides hope for that situation. Some of you have a prayer list maybe in your, your house on the refrigerator of prayers that have in your mind have gone unanswered and you're challenged in this season where you, oh, hope and joy. And you say, yeah, but there's this. I'm telling you in the midst of a season of unanswered prayers, God gives 
hope. For some of you at this season, when everyone talks about gift giving and, and different things to celebrate, say, so you know what? We just don't have it. Financially, it's really tough. Boy, I can't even think about presents because I'm trying to pay the electric bill. I'm trying to pay rent. I'm trying to pay the, in the midst of financial struggle, God gives hope. For some of you that have brought dreams into this season, say, oh, one day I'll be this, and you've sacrificed because of the, the heaviness of life, and, and, you've, and you've set aside some things that God has called you to, and you have dreams unfulfilled, God gives hope. Some of you, this Christmas season is the first season that you'll be walking through without that loved one that has passed away. You can't imagine going through a season that you've shared all these experiences with with someone that's now no longer physically here. I'm telling you, in the middle of that, God steps into your world. God allows himself to become human. And then even when Jesus was, was, was crucified and resurrected, he didn't leave us alone. He said, I gotta go away, but I'm gonna send a comforter to be along beside you, to walk this journey out with you. And in the middle of that awareness of God's presence in my life, you know what that does? He gives me hope because my momentary struggles, they are going to seem really heavy right now. But in a few years, in a few days, in a few weeks, in whatever God's timing is, I say, wow, God, you were with me there. I still have hope. And so in the middle of that season of expectation, can I just breathe some life into you in this room today? You that are joining online, maybe the reason why you're joining online is because you're depressed and don't want to be around people. I'm telling you, whatever the reason is, God brings hope hope to you. Why? Because his word is true and it never, never fails. This is hope. This is hope. Paul, I love it. It's not just isolated. It's not just one guy, Luke, trying to breathe this idea of hope. Paul says it too to the church in Corinth. He says in chapter four, verse 16, he says, this is why, that's why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small, and they will not last long. Yet, they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. My mom used to say it, and she still says it to this day. In fact, all of us kids and grandkids, we kind of roll our eyes when she says it about tough times. She's like, a temporary inconvenience for a permanent solution, right? How many surgeries Chloe has had? And she said it to Chloe probably every time. A temporary, in- and I can see Chloe rolling her eyes at grandma right now. But the truth of it is, is that God's word says the same. It says, yet they produce for us a glory that will vast, that vastly outweighs them and and will last forever. I understand that currently your temporary inconvenience doesn't feel so temporary and it feels a little bit more than an inconvenience. But when I read God's word, when I understand the truth of his scripture, I have to understand that my particular situation does not change or alter the truth of this word. And when I see the promises of God in this word, I know that he can I know that he's still here. I've got hope. I've got hope and understanding that this idea is just a temporary, this this struggle is just a temporary season of life. Paul goes on to say, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. The hope for the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see, they'll last forever forever. And that's the idea of hope in this Christmas season. So what is our hope? It's Jesus. That he came and that he's coming again. And that he's coming again. And in a season right now where you may be struggling to physically or to to experience that hope right now, I'm telling you, look back and see the faithfulness of God. Understand and embrace where God's got you now that is a learning moment for you. And I'm not trying to belittle the, the tension that you may feel, but the truth of it is, is it pales in comparison to the glory that awaits you. There's a hope. There's a hope. So what impact should this hope have in our life? Well, we shared earlier how that it is the foundation 
And I love Pastor Clayton and the team saying that song about the cornerstone, right? It is the foundation upon which without it, the building falls apart, right? It's, it is so foundational to our story. It brings us the opportunity to experience joy and peace and love. And in the same way as with Zechariah, the angel says to him, I've heard your prayer. And the child that you will be a father to, I'm preparing and, and growing within them the passion. In fact, it was filled with the Holy Spirit before he was even born. How crazy cool is that, right? It says of John, he says that he will be there to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. So what impact should this hope have in our life? Well, it changes our perspective for one thing. It changes the way we see every experience in our life. It changes the way the crowded parking lot at the mall feels. It changes the way that the bustle and hustle of the season feels. It changes the way we experience our family gatherings, right? It seems like in these seasons of celebration and family that there's, there's this, this highlighted of the positive and highlighted of the negative. And I understand that there are some tense family and relational situations. I get it. But when we have this hope, when we understand that God's glory in the future far outweighs the inconvenience, the struggle of the past, it changes our perspective. Maybe today you need to, to, to just mentally and, and really intentionally tell yourself, say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into this holiday season and the, the moments with my family with a different perspective. I'm not going to see that person because of the offense or the hurt that they have, have, have inflicted upon me, but the plan that God has for their life. And God, help me to see them the way, the way you see them. This idea of hope changes our perspective. Eugene Peterson says it this way. He says, hoping is not dreaming. It's not spinning an illusion or fantasy to protect us from our boredom or our pain. It means a confident, alert expectation that God will do what he said he will do. It's the foundation. It's imagination, I love this phrase, it is imagination put in the harness of faith. Don't you love that imagery? God doesn't say stop dreaming, imagine, no, 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 no. He says put all those creative thoughts and those dreams that I've given you in the harness of faith. Let it, let it be something that fulfills God's purposes in your life. It's a willingness to let God do it his way and in his time, boy, if we, needed ever an example of God doing things in his way in his time. Look at the Christmas story, right? You got Zachariah and Elizabeth. Oh, we're too old to have kids. Bam, Gabriel comes. You're going to have a son. His name is John, and here's what his plan is going to be. Wow, God, we didn't see that one coming, right? Mary and Joseph. Joseph's got this incredible experience we'll talk about the next couple of days. I'm not even married yet, or whatever, and she's pregnant. Are you kidding me right now? Ah, shame, guilt. No, Joseph, it's okay. Take Mary. There's something happening here in this situation. God does things in his way and in his time. He's done that all throughout the course of human history, right? All throughout our knowledge. And so why is it that we would think that our current experience somehow changes the character of God? It doesn't. He will always be the same. His word is true. And for that, we have hope. We have hope. He changes our perspective he changes our, pri our priorities. Those things that we thought were really important, they become less important. Those things that we didn't think were really important, wow, that's really what God says to focus on. Those things that are eternal, those things are temporary. Yeah, I wish that was a little bit different, but those things are temporary. I'm really more concerned on the eternal. And then he changes our purpose he changes the reason why we are put here. He did this for Zechariah. He said, you know what? I know you're, uh, you're, you're struggling and you're, you're, you're really just frustrated because you haven't born this son, you haven't had kids, but I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna breathe life. I'm gonna interrupt. I'm gonna give you that son, but it's not just so that you can have a son. Your son is going to prepare the way of the Lord. He will be the voice of one crying in the wilderness, right? And it is that moment that he says, wow, this hope it changes my perspective. It changes my priority. It changes our purpose. If we truly believe in the hope of Jesus' return one day, how does that truth impact your daily life? 
Does it? It should. I agree. It should impact all of the different situations that you come in contact with. Oh, I'm mad at that person. I'm frustrated with that person. Man, Jesus is coming back. You can get over that offense. They need to know the hope that God has given you. They need to understand that these momentary struggles, you may have an offense towards me. I'm gonna, you figure that out or whatever, but these, they're not gonna last right? There's an eternity to be considered with here. There's a, there's a, a, a different picture here. It changes our perspective. And if we're not careful in this Christmas season, this idea of hope, it becomes all about just looking back and saying, wow, God, that was really cool. That was awesome what you did. No, this idea of Advent Christmas season is about looking back and remembering and saying, yes, and saying, looking forward and saying, yes, that we have a hope. This idea of, of, of Advent and the, the, the hope and, and, and the coming or the arrival, it was twofold. It's always been twofold. He came and he's coming. That gives us hope. I understand, however, I've said this and I'll re, restate it this way. It really is tough sometimes when we, when we live in this world and this earth of all the struggles and we find ourselves in a similar situation that Zachariah and Elizabeth found themselves And you could even be sitting in this room today or even joining online and hearing the words that I'm saying, knowing they're true, and yet. I understand it. I've been there. I get it. I understand. I can only, not beg you, but I can only encourage you greatly to look back at the unchanging nature of God. And look through the way he has interacted with men and women all throughout history and understand that God in the semi, he, he's, boy, he's, how many of you understand he's never really early, right, in our timetable. He's, God, God, you really missed a chance to show up early there. No, but he's always right on time. Cliche, I get it, but it's always true because his plans are not like our plans. And it seems like in these moments that we would be do ourselves well to be encouraged that God the Father, he came. He interrupted the, the course of human history. He took on flesh and became man. And he came and he was with us, Emmanuel, his name, God with us. And I'm telling you today, church, that his word is true And he still comes and he still shows up and he says to you, you know what? I'm going to be with you these next couple weeks. That's the hope that you have. I'm walking this out with you. I I want to, to walk alongside. Why do I know that? Because he can't change. His word is true. Jesus said, if I go, I'm going to come, I'm going to go prepare a place and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to be with you. The word also says where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in your midst. God not only came, but he still is coming to us and living with us and being with us, and we can be assured of that hope. God wants to be an encouragement to you today that he is with you. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come and and help me conclude today. I wanna share with you a story at the end of this, a story that is from our world most uh, recent. It's about actually not really recent. It's about 30 years ago now, but a story that I believe... um, it's a, it's a great representation of what I believe that spiritually God wants to say to you and to me today and that there is hope that he not only came, but he still comes and is with us. The story is a, is a man from the UK. His name was Derek Redman. Some of you may have remembered this story. It's a true story. Derek Redman was a distance runner. And uh, in the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona, there was a, a moment that proved to be one of track and field's most memorable moments. Derek Redmond had dreamed all of his life of winning a gold medal in the 400 meter race. And his dream was in sight at the Barcelona Olympics as the guns sounded in the semifinals at Barcelona. He was running the race of his life and could see the finish line as he rounded the turn into the back stretch. And then suddenly a sharp pain goes in the back of his leg and he falls face first onto the track with a torn right hamstring. Sports Illustrated records the events like this. Quote from this article, it says, as the medical attendants were approaching, Redmond fought 
to his feet. It was his animal instinct, he would later say. He set out hopping in this crazed attempt to finish the race. When he reached the stretch, there was a large man in a t-shirt came out of the stands, hurled aside a security guard, ran to Redmond, embracing him. It was Jim Redmond, Derek's father. You don't have to do this, he told his weeping son. Yeah, I, I do, Dad. Well then, said Jim, we're gonna finish this race together. And they did. Fighting off security men, the son's head sometimes buried into his father's shoulder. They stayed in Derek's lane all the way to the end as the crowd gasped and then rose and howled and wept. Derek didn't walk away with the gold medal that day, but he walked away with an incredible memory of a father who when he saw his son in pain, left the stands, pushed through all the obstacles, came to the aid and rescue of his son and helped him finish the race. Love that story. I love what it represents. I've seen so many different uh, portrayals of what God, or of, of what this, this father-son combo did. And every time I watch it, I just see the spiritual implications of that. Because just like there's stories throughout God's word, and I can think of when, when Jesus was in the garden praying, God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. And God comes and, and interrupts and, and is, is with his son there in that moment. The same way this There are those moments that we walk through all in our lives in in this earth that we say, God, I feel like feel like I've just torn a hammy, right? I feel like I'm trying to finish this race and I can't go any further. And God just may be wanting you to hear from this pastor today. Hey, you know what? It may be a a cheesy illustration, but the truth of it is, is that God still interrupts our plans today and he'll come out of the stands and he'll come from heaven into a manger and interrupt the story of human history there. And he'll put his arm around you and say, Hey buddy, Hey, Hey young lady, there's hope hope. There's hope. If you'll let me, I'll walk this journey with you. I'll understand your pain. That's what God does for us. Jesus reflected that same hope when he said, I'm with you always to the very ends of the age. There is hope. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. There's hope. Would you stand with me all over this room? As we prepare to just conclude our time, I'm just gonna ask you a favor. Would you join me right now? Would you just close your eyes and bow your heads all over this room? And would you just personally thank God? Don't start moving around and be dismissed yet. We'll get there. But would you just thank God for hope that he has given us? God, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus God, you didn't have to do do it that way. There was other ways for you to redeem man, Lord. You could have you could have chosen a different plan, but you saw fit to come with us and fulfill all the prophecies that you had said from the beginning. God, you took on on yourself the nature of our flesh. You became fully man. You were still fully God, but you came. You gave us hope, and God, we're grateful for that grateful that you never change, that you prove yourself to us in this current day and you give us a hope for a future. God, we so are honored of that hope. I'm just going to ask you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. You may be here in this room and you say, you know what, Pastor John, that's great, but I haven't even started this journey. There's things in my life that my life is going in a direction right now that is not towards God. And I know through even this message today. I know that when I see scripture and when I understand the story of Jesus, that my life is not right. See, the Bible says that all of us have fallen short of God's glory. And that means that there's a, there's, there's an element of sin in all of our lives. And we have to come to the point where we recognize that and recognize there had to be a price paid for that sin. And you and I cannot, or will we ever be able to pay that price? But Jesus did. He was our hope. And by accepting that gift of his forgiveness and his payment for your sins on the cross, you can begin this race and begin this journey with God. And that may be you today. And you say, you know what? I'd love to to begin that journey with the Lord today. And everybody's heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're going to pray together in a minute. But just for recognition so that I can know who we're praying together with, um, would you do me the honor of saying, you know what, Pastor John, would you include me in that prayer? 
I want to ask Jesus to come into my heart. I want to start this this journey with him today. And uh, and we're just going to pray together. If that's you, would you just raise your hand all over this place? I see you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm going to wait just for a minute. Hallelujah. If you're joining with us online, there's a link that pops up. I just encourage you to click that. We will connect with you and pray together with you. Give you some more information about following Jesus in your life. It's incredible. It's incredible. Anybody else? Real quick, just a few seconds. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Church, all together, those of you that didn't raise your hand, I I just believe that many of you have already received Jesus. But will you join all of us? All of our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed with these few that have raised their hand. We're going to pray together. Just a short prayer. There's nothing special about the words, but it reflects an attitude of the heart. Would you just repeat this prayer after me today, all of us in the room? Jesus, I love you. I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me. Thank you for paying the price for my sins. I receive your forgiveness. Come into my heart. I want to live for you from this day forward. Thank you for saving me. Amen, amen, amen. Can we celebrate those that have just asked Jesus to come into their heart today? Hallelujah. God, we have hope. The cool thing about it is is you saw the different progression of some that have already asked Jesus to come into their heart. And baptism is just that public profession of that. So... That's incredible. You that have raised your hands, that may be the next step that you want to follow the Lord in obedience. The way that we can help you walk through that, we have first steps class that takes place here at the church, but the way to get engaged in that is to come and let us pray together with you. You can fill out the connect cards. That's the reason why those are so significant. So it's it's not just a prayer and then we walk out the door and we, we live life on our own. That's not the way God intended it. He wanted us to live this out together. So I just encourage you to to connect in that way. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward as we begin to conclude on my right and left to stay away from the middle. Please be careful of the the wet plastic up there and just help steward that, that moment. If they'll just join me, those that have raised their hand, would you do us the honor? In just a minute, we're going to be dismissed. Um, would you do us the honor of connecting with some of these that will be down here at the front and let us pray together with you? The reason why that's significant is because we really believe this idea of walking this out together is biblical and it's, it's, it's better if we could do this together. And God wants us to walk this out as, as, uh, as a family, as a community. Some of you may be in the room and say, you know what, Pastor John, there's a need in my life that, that I just... I just really, um, I really want prayer and I need somebody to connect and we'd love to pray together with you as well. This is hope. This is hope. Would you do me a favor and just be hope to someone this week? God wants to change somebody's life because of the, the hope that you will reflect. Amen. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you and your coming and going and may you be a reflection of God's grace and his hope in your families job and all over the triad and the places that you go. God bless you. Come forward and let us pray with you if you'd like. God bless you. Have a great week. You're dismissed. Amen.